Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hannah Hostick. I'm co-president of the Sterling Library Friends, and it is such a pleasure to welcome everyone to this very special lecture. This lecture actually kicks off um, the 10 days of connection for our library. It's a time in which we try to focus on connecting people with each other uh, around some shared interest and sometimes around diverse interests. We have quite a program, uh, quite a schedule of programs over the next few days. We have swapping stories on Wednesday, tomorrow, in person at 6.30 at the library, come and listen to stories that our members, our friends, high school students will share um, in terms of their own lives and the connections that they have made or have felt since COVID or even before. Um, we also have a New Yorker discussion group on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, folk dancing for the family in person on May 7th, the New Yorker conversation is online. And we have Cinema Paradiso coming up and also films with Shelley Isaacs. There's a lot going on at our library. We try to mix up um, in person with uh, uh, remote learning. And um, we're just really excited to ever have everyone here tonight. And we're especially thrilled to welcome back uh, Professor Bacha Cohen. Uh, we're going to have Marilyn London now introduce her. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'm Marilyn London, and I am membership chairman and a member of the board of the Sterling Road Library. And it's my pleasure, along with Hannah, to welcome you to um, tonight's program. And it is, as she said, the opening program of our 2023 10 Days of Connection. Actually, it is very fitting that but that Dr. Bacha Cohn is our opening speaker because we have been very fortunate to have a connection with Bacha that spans many years. And it is Bacha who helped us through COVID to make us so successful because she was our first Zoom program and we didn't even know what Zoom was. And Bacha, you were our first then, and you're our first tonight. So needless to say, you are very, very special to us. Um, we'll, and we look forward to many, many more firsts together. Definitely. For those of you who are in the gallery tonight and who are friends of the library, please know that we are so grateful to you and we thank you for being a friend. And it is because of your support of us that we are able to bring you Bacha and, and all of the other wonderful speakers that we do have. So thank you. And for anybody who is new to us, welcome. We're happy to have you join us. And if you like our program, um, please check us out at www.sterlingfriends.org. Our membership starts at $10 a year. We are the biggest bargain in town because once you're a member, you know of all of our programs, everything in the library and on Zoom is now free to you and um, support us. We would love to have you join us. So Bacha, we are so happy to have you tonight. For those of you who don't know about Bacha, she comes from Mexico City where she was born and received her PhD in Mesoamerican studies at UNAM. And then in moving to the United States, she has been teaching for many, many years, both in Mexico and in Florida. She is a professor at FIU, UM, and the Osher Lifelong, Lifelong Learning Institute. And she has published many numerous articles on, on specialized art and history, and uh, is even an author of a work in fiction, which right now is still in Spanish, but we're waiting anxiously for it to be translated into English. For a few years, so we've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, Bacha's topic is entitled Art as Healing, and we are most interested in hearing her speak and to, to hear what she has to say to us. So Bacha, it's all yours, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the 
Friends of the Sterling Library, you do a wonderful job. And of course, it is my pleasure to be back. And Art of Healing was a title that was given to me. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy this uh, lecture, which I did enjoy preparing for you. So let's talk a little bit of, about what is art as healing and what am I going to talk about? So we have, first of all, we have to take into consideration researchers that they have been studying how art is going to affect people in a good way. And, and it, it would be part of art therapy, but we're not going to talk only about art therapy, but also that not only about creating art, I was going to say, but also about viewing art, being in a museum, going to a gallery, enjoying art, being engaged with art and participating in that art. Today, we have more experiences that are interactive, but going just going to a museum, it will help you. And there have been many studies about it and how th that it will decrease your stress it will add longevity, so you will live more. And that has been proven for all of this research that has been going on for years. So for example, if you go to L'Orangerie, which is a beautiful museum in Paris, where you are surrounded by the work of Monet, Claude Monet, where he did this uh, very majestic water lilies, and you are surrounded by this art, you feel this kind of serenity, tranquility. Somehow you are connected with those water lilies, with the reflection on the water, which is augmented. And you can see here the ethereal representation of that reflection. It is really brings tranquility, it brings happiness, it brings joy. And you see the um, amount of um, space that has been given to this area where the paintings are. But on the other hand, when you look at paintings, sometimes like the Impressionists, and this is a painting by Callebot, and uh, we feel that we are inside the paintings. Where are we? In a park, in a place full of nature, of trees, of flowers, and you feel good because that is why when we see Impressionist artists, we feel that there is a connection with it because of the atmosphere, the light that is reflected, the colors, the vibrant colors that they use. So we engage with the image. And the more, the more we see those images, we are more connected to uh, with them. Because also when you think about the Impressionist, because everybody knows about Impressionism, um, but at the, at the time when they presented their art, nobody liked it, nobody connected with it. But for us, this is, something very old already. So it's something familiar and we'll get that engagement. We we'll get that connection. You feel like you are there. You are in that park, in Parc Monceau in Paris with Gustave Callebaud on the side painting this beautiful landscape. So of course, Monet, and I have to begin with Monet again because Monet in Giverny, he not only created the paintings, but he created the atmosphere that is going to be his only source of inspiration for many years. And he's going to say about the garden, that he was creating this garden for the pleasure of the eye, but also as a motive to paint. So it's going to be that um, and richness that he feels all the time as he connects and not only connects with what he's looking at, but he tended the flowers and the plants in his garden. Actually, um, at some point, he extended, he expanded the the the, 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 the um, garden that he had created, and he made this Japanese garden, as you can see the painting here. But also, you can see the photograph of Monet being besides a Japanese bridge that he created, and he just loved that there and. and the water lilies comes from that inspiration and from that connection to nature, but also that connection with art. So he created the, this, um, this garden for him. He didn't create it for us to enjoy today because today is a museum and you can uh, just stroll around the, that uh, garden, but also you can connect with what he was looking at. Those water lilies, the reflection of, of the of the sun or even the same flowers on the water, etc. But on the other hand, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what has been researched. 
And they say that little neurons in your head, they focus into familiar forms, into familiar patterns, into uh, shapes that you understand and you can um, be familiar with them. So they would soothe you. The more familiar they become, they, the more tranquility you're going to feel. So Rothko here, and he was really very interested in creating emotions, having that engagement. So he began to develop what he called color field paintings. You have him here in front of one of those large creations that he made. And art looks, uh, when you're looking at art and you're really engaging with art, it puts your brain into motion, into working, into thinking, into feeling, even if you don't like it, you have that connection because there is something going on. And Rothko himself, he's gonna say that you have to be very close to the painting to be enveloped within the painting. And he would recommend you to be 18 inches away from the painting to have that intimacy, to have that communication. So you develop that engagement with the image itself. And after a while, you appreciate it more. And the colors, are going to embrace you somehow if you have that proximity with art. There's this kind of meditation where you are, when you are in front of a painting done by Rothko. So art can be very subjective as you all know. And because you have different emotions, you have different backgrounds, you have different stories behind, of course, and you have that connection or non-connection with different kinds of art. But it can be also an individual experience. At the same time, it can also be a collective experience as we're going to see. So we have Rothko studying and his goal is really to have the sense of atmospheric depth. And he's gonna say about it, often towards nightfall, there's a feeling in the air of mystery, threat, frustration, all of this at once. I would like my paintings to have the quality of such moments. So he's not painting a landscape. He's not painting a flower. He's not painting a portrait. He's using color as the communication tool for you to engage with it. And not even we don't even have a title to be engaged. But today we have other kind of art that we can engage on. So we have immersive experiences like this one. And let me show you. So there are science studies that they show us that viewing and also creating art, it will help you alleviate any symptoms of anxiety and depression. And I'm sure that there are some psychologists here in the audience that can help us out more about that. But you can just go to a place like this. This is uh, in, in Miami, by the way, it was an immersive experience, still is there. And I recommend you to go if you are interested in having an experience because you can interact with art. So as you walk, you move the lines. For example, here, you can see that she's rubbing the floor and look how the line is going to be completely different. So any, any music, not only art that is visual, also you can have experiences like this one, music, doodling, pottery, any of, of those kind of things that you can engage with art and it's gonna be interactive. Then super blue, exactly. That's the one that is, it is super blue. But I, I'm not so sure if this one in particular is still going on, uh, but there's others as well. So uh, that interaction, it will also help you to have that feeling of tranquility or a little bit, less stress than your regular life. So when we see art, music as well, it can help you soothe any chronic pain. And there's, these are scientific studies. 
they accelerate the brain development in young children. And I have to tell you a little bit about my experience, the experience that I just passed through this. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer um, a few months ago, last year. I went to surgery, chemo, uh, radiation, you name it, all of the above. And the first time that I felt a little better to go out, I went to the Margulis collection. All of a sudden, I felt human again. I have, of course, a history of this relationship with art. I'm an art historian. But just by engaging in something that was a little bit, you know, out of the ordinary, something that is sometimes colorful or have textures, it helped me at some point feel connected and feel happy again. And I can attest to that, that art is really healing. So there is many um, research papers. There's a, a, a research um, group in London that they had around 50 people, uh, I'm sorry, like a thousand more than 1,000 people that uh, were 50 and older. And over 14 uh, years, they were observing them. They, observing them. they went to museums, to theaters, they would go to concerts uh, at least once or twice a year. And by just doing that, it, they increase their longevity. So they live longer. And they say that even going once a month or every few months, it, the, the benefits increase more than 31%. So, so imagine the, um, the benefits of going to a museum or a concert or anything related to the art. Uh, this is the Margolis collection. Somebody asked right away. But if we go back to history and we see how Get uh, was one of the first um, thinkers that was trying to understand how color affects our moods or how color affects our behavior and how we perceive color and how we perceive art at the same time, we can see that Get was actually against or refuting, or uh, it was like a reaction against Newton's ideas of color, because he was Newton was more connected and more interested in light and how light reflects color. So uh, Gette, what he was actually analyzing was the color itself in pigment. And he's going to write about the theory of colors. And if you see how he proposed what we are going to understand about colors, he said that the colors have qualities. So for example, he would associate red with the beautiful. He would get orange with the noble. And those are qualities that he gave to each one of the colors. Yellow with good. Then we have green with the useful. We also have blue related to the common and violet or purple with the unnecessary. And these are the qualities that get the gave to each one of the colors. But also he gave to the colors the um, different categories of the human cognition. So the um, red and the orange would be the rational. He would also get together the yellow and the green to give us the other category of the human cognition, which would be the intellectual. The green and the blue would be the sensual. And the purple and the red coming back to the beginning, having this full circle, would be the imagination. So it's rather interesting how he was one of the first developers of what we're going to call the color psychology. Not only did he write about it, but he was um, actually practicing somehow. So he would say that the color of clothes also will affect our mood or we're going to represent the mood that we are on or people are gonna perceive the mood that we are on with the color that we're wearing. So of course today I'm happy because I'm wearing this color. And also in his house in Frankfurt, he's going to paint each one of the rooms uh, with different colors. So for example, we're gonna have that where he received visitors was painted yellow. And he said that he was creating this cheerful, lively atmosphere for his visitors to come into this room. But also he would have this bluish gray room 
to be very elegant and uplifting because it would be the festive hall. So he would have also visitors here, but it is a different feeling when you get into this room. And in his bedroom or his study, he painted the walls green to have this calming effect. So every color affects us. So by an artist using colors, they will affect as well our mood or our perception of life. There are many studies, again, that going to a museum will help create a peaceful environment and it will help you with depression and anxiety. And as we go along, we have the other side of the spectrum of art or art as therapy, because we have artists, the expressionists in, in particular, like Kirchner, who are going to use art as this explosion of expression of what they are feeling, their anxiety or the angst, which can be collective and also it can be individual, but he's expressing the anxiety of the time. And we're talking about the first war and he used this uh, representation of a crowded um, street, but nobody speaks to each other. So he uses this to express himself or this one, which is a self-portrait. And he is expressing it, what he feels, and he's expressing it to us. You can see the twisted body, not only the colors, look how vibrant and how aggressive they can be. Even the um, skewed perspective or the jagged line in the mountains right here, but also the twisted body that he's looking at us, kind of looking us at us for help. But he also suffered from, um, First of all, addiction to morphine, anxiety, depression, and he committed suicide, I have to tell you. So we have that a repetitive pattern will help you have a calming effect. So paint by numbers, like we see this one by Andy Warhol, which is ra rather a, a satire somehow. Uh, but if you are coloring, if you're using art as therapy, not only going to a museum, contemplating paintings or a sculpture, or, but also engaging with art, coloring or painting will also help you somehow with anxiety, depression, stress, etc. We have to touch a little bit about uh, Van Gogh and his own representation of anxiety. And I'm not going to go very deep into his own art, but look how vibrant it is. And you can interpret it as you like. It can be his own. Um, anxiety, but also it can be his own passion. So uh, these are both things represented in this, rep in this painting where there are no straight lines, everything is contorting, everything is moving, the trees even, they are piercing the sky somehow, the, uh, the stars are moving. It seems like there's a lot of wind, even though probably there is no wind at all. So when an artist feels this passion inside and feels that, that energy, it has to come out of it. And it is, of course, inside his body, inside his soul, and somehow it's exploding at some point. It has to explode. And until that moment when he expresses himself, he can be really in pain. So in Van Gogh, we see that in his paintings, in his brushstroke, in each one of his compositions, he uses a lot of impasto, a lot of thick layers of color. And even he uses the brushstroke. For example, the path right here is forming, is formed by the brushstroke. So Van Gogh is the perfect example of this man who has been suffering all his life. He was, uh, actually he failed the exam to study theology, then he wanted to be a missionary. He also failed the exam. Then he um, fell in love twice. He was rejected both times. Then he had this arrangement with an alcoholic prostitute. It was, he was, he lived with her for a year. Then he painted peasants, but also one of them became pregnant. So he was accused of forcing himself upon one of them. Uh, so of course, a lot of issues, but somehow places that were peaceful, they were familiar and repeating the familiar will help him as well. So art for him was, again, an expression of himself, but probably also therapeutical. So the bedroom, which we see right here, one of them, he repeated it three times. And we have his own bedroom with no 
portraits of, well, we see portraits in the wall, but I mean, with no people inside the bedroom, but the repetition of a familiar place, probably it helped him because he painted this one first and, and actually he is painting it at the moment when he is expecting his good friend um, Gauguin to come to Arles. And then when he was in, uh, in recovery, actually in one of the institutions, uh, he paints both th these two other paintings, as you can see right here. And they are in different um, museums, as you see as well. But through his own portraits, you have the image that is transforming. So of course, we know the story of the ear that he cut his ear love and he gave it to a prostitute. And he has a story, uh, that a very, um, I would say painful story of madness, of illnesses, of uh, feeling that somebody's gonna kill him and he's gonna be poisoned. He went to the hospital in San Raimi and he is going to paint himself in several locations. And we see that tormented line through his portraits. We see how he's suffering and how he's trying to heal himself. He had supervised strolls when he was in the institution, but you can feel that anxious state of mind. And it doesn't seem probably that he's suffering, but sometimes we see a lot of energy that it is probably represented in these paintings, in all of those paintings that we see through that period. Before, of course, we didn't have that um, representation, but afterwards, uh, the last years of, of his life, he's painting more and more passionate. But look at this painting, because I want you to see the difference with this painting. He's gonna do this composition for his nephew, the birth of his nephew. And he paints this beautiful, calming representation of a, 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 an almond blossom with a blue sky. And of course he had inspiration from Japanese woodcuts, as you can see on the left side. But if we compare these two paintings, which is really rather interesting, one is the very famous irises from 1889, and the other one is when his nephew is born. And as you can see here, one is very, very calming, soothing, and the other one has a lot of energy. It is vibrant. So we get a lot of different information through this kind of representation. But I wanna to touch also with another issue. And this is a painting by Piet Mondrian. Piet Mondrian is known for his uh, paintings of the squares with primary colors, red, blue, and uh, also yellow and white and black, of course. But this painting, which he began to do at the beginning of his career, it is a dying chrysanthemum. And what he was looking as a goal was to paint something spiritual. He was involved in theosophism. And it is kind of a portrait of a flower. The flower itself is a representation of birth, death, and rebirth. The sunflower has the symbolism of the sun. And this, the chrysanthemum, is the moon. So Mondrian was representing something that it was the soul itself. It was emotional, but it was also soothing and at the same time philosophical. When we think about his squares, his, they are completely different, but what he was searching to find was um, spirituality. On the other hand, we have Edvard Munch. Edvard Munch, uh, we have four different versions of the scream, as you can see them here painting them in different occasions. You can see also the, um, the different uh, periods of the different dates when he painted them. And some of them are pastels or a combination with oil paintings. As you find the expression of the stream, it is iconic today. And um, he didn't create it just like that. He created it for a whole series of paintings that he was going to call the freeze of life. He was trying to represent the universal anxiety of the modern man. This is a collective angst that was felt at that time. And he uses those bands of colors to express movement and also a personal emotional crisis because he had a nervous breakdown. And he stated that his goal was to study the soul. And he said, that is to say, the study of my own self. 
it is a representation of his own emotions, his own feelings, his own suffering. And when he created it, he's going to recall that exact moment. And I'm going to quote him. I was walking down the road with two friends with the sunset. So when, when the sun set, suddenly the sky turned as red as blood. I stopped and leaned against the fence, feeling unspeakably tired. Tongues of fire and blood stretched over the bluish black fjord. My friends went on walking while I lagged behind, shivering with fear. Then I heard the enormous infinite scream of nature. And this is a moment that he's recreating. And actually we see him describe this moment with his personal anguish that he had. And he said, for several years, I was almost mad. You know my picture, the scream? I was stretched to the limit. Nature was screaming in my blood. After that, I gave up hope ever of being able to love again. And the original name is the scream of nature. So he is representing himself in this portrait. He had lived also a very painful life. And this painting shows you the family. But if we go back a little bit, his mother had died of tuberculosis at, when he was very young. He has also one daughter that died. I'm sorry, one sister that dies. His father was very oppressive. He was very religious. Laura, another of his sisters, was diagnosed with mental illness. And his brother died as well. So, of course, a lot of sickness, a lot of death. He was also a sickly uh, boy growing up. And he suffered from depression as well. In this painting that he called Meta Metabol Metabolism, it's Adam and Eve, actually, as you can see here. And he painted, he painted this one after he broke up with his girlfriend, Tula Larsen. He was preoccupied with the fall of men. So we can see a little bit of his personality through his paintings. And he had suicidal thoughts. And he's going to say that, uh, that he lived with dead. My mother, my sister, my grandfather, my father, and he will always hear, kill yourself, and then it's over. Why live? So all of that we can sense through his paintings. But at the same time, he's representing life and death because he was also interested in science, in biology. And all of a sudden, there's the healing aspect of art because life begins again. And this is the New Jerusalem, regeneration, rebirth, as he is representing. in the. And this is part of the freeze of life, the whole series that he was doing. But on the other hand, he suffered a lot of depression, anxiety. He was also an addict of alcohol, opium. And he wrote later that my condition was verging on madness. I was touch and go. He felt hallucinations, persecution. So he was feeling paranoia. When he checks into the clinic of Dr. Daniel Jacobson, he is going to be there eight months. And he's going to bring his own uh, camera. And you can see the, fel the first selfie. He takes his camera and he takes this picture in the bathroom of the clinic, which is really interesting to see. But then he took art as therapy and he would just stroll around his house and he would just look at nature. And he said as well, nature is not only all that is visible to the eye. It also includes the inner pictures of the soul. And through that, through that kind of painting, to that kind of uh, also observing nature, he was able to heal himself somehow. And his paintings, and this is a beautiful painting that he made, was on for the um, University of Oslo in 1916. He said, I do not believe in the art, which is not the compulsive result of man's urge to open his heart. So again, we can see both sides of art, the one that you are contemplating or the one that you are creating. And both of them are very helpful. And I want also to tell you a little bit of the story of this doctor, Hans Prinzen. He was a psychiatrist in Germany. He was also an art historian and he was interested in the art that was produced by the mentally ill. So he's going to uh, visit the University of Heidelberg where they had this uh, psychiatric, uh, psychiatric hospital. And he was interested in the kind of art that these patients were cr creating. Somehow he's going to collect all of those art pieces, not only paintings, 
but around 5,000 examples from different psychiatric institutions from Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and wherever he could travel. He began to study them because many of them were done just as a sketch. Uh, they would use ink, canvases sometimes, uh, scraps of newspaper, tissue, or even old sugar bags or toilet paper or whatever they could find in the waste paper baskets in those institutions. So what Princeton was, do, was um, observing is how the people who have issues, men, they were mentally ill and they were in those institutions, how they had different way of looking at the world. And all of those are pieces. They have a variety from landscapes to self-portraits. Some of them are very symbolic and some of them are completely enigmatic and very, very complex. And I'm showing you some of the examples. Uh, this one uh, is part of the collection, uh, is by um, a man called Natterer. And he had this religious visions, hallucinations, also very sexually obsessed. Some of the paintings are also very sexual. And he paints his also his nightmares, his horrors, his fears. Somehow he uses art to express himself. Uh, and you can see this one as well, which is a self-portrait by um, Franz Karl Buller, another man who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And he taught himself to paint. He wanted to cope his, with his own situation. And through art, he was able to control somehow a little bit of this schizophrenia. So he painted a lot of self-portraits, but also people around him and his own nightmares as well. All of those psychotic visions, uh, angels and, and, and monsters and demonic dogs like you can see here. So you have an array of different paintings by this man, Bueller. So Prince Horn thought that the material that he was gathering would help probably to diagnose these people, but also he realized that they had a lot of power, expressionistic power and an artistic value. So he collected around 5,000 art pieces, not only paintings, but also sculptures like this one. This is by Carl Genzel, also one of the cold 10 psych psychophren psychophrenics that he collected. And at the beginning, he started to make shapes with chewed bread. Later, he's going to use wood like this one. This is a wood carving and uh, very sexualized, many of them. Some of them are also have his own hallucinations that are, they have a religious theme in some of them. But look at this painting by Paul Klee. Because of the German expressionists, the French surrealists, and Paul Klee in particular, they recognize the facility of these people that they could abstract the human figure. And by observing the collection that uh, Prince Horn had, he was inspired to do a simplistic abstract kind of art that we are we know about Paul Klee. Not only that, but also many other avant-garde artists were inspired by this collection. Uh, Ugo Boll, one of the founders of the Dada movement, he said that uh, Princeton's book representing nothing else than the turning point of two epochs. And Hans Arp, also one of the Dada members, later he's going to be a uh, surrealist. He said that uh, it was very important art for them, art, I'm sorry, the art was very important for them because it repelled by the slaughterhouses of the World War. So art for them is a way to escape the horrors. But this is a, one of the paintings collected by uh, Prince Hearn. They wanted to understand the madness of the world. So the artists are going to explore also the world of the mentally ill. And André Breton, as long as along as other um, other artists, they're going to use that book published by Prince Horn, and they're going to nickname the book the Surrealist Bible. It was going to be an inspirational guide to bring uncensored images of their own deeply buried unconscious, and I'm quoting André Breton, which we see the photo of here on your left. Another surrealist artist, Max Ernst, 
who was studying at the University of Bonn. He studied philosophy, art history, literature, psychology, and psychiatry. He visited asylums and he was really fascinated with the artwork of the mentally ill patients. He also knew about the collection of Prince Horn and he's going to be inspired by that. So surrealism has a limit of that. He did this painting called Oedipus Rex and of course comes from uh, the study of the brain by uh, Freud and the uh, Oedipus complex. So there's a lot of sexual undercurrents here, the gender roles that you can find in this horn uh, kind of, of head that we see here, this bird with horns. The other one, of course, you can see that probably this is the female and the male. The core that it is um, just attached right here and it is limiting somehow the sexuality of this couple on the other hand, we have this knot, which is related and symbolic of the female vulva. And not only that, it is pierced. Uh, the, 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 the fingers right here are pierced with this uh, kind of, of, of instrument and the knot shell is pierced with the arrow. And he was inspired by this French magazine called La Nature. And so it's the same idea, but of course in his own world, so Max Ernst and Dali as well, they are gonna be inspired by the subconscious and by the expression of what there is in their mind, the um, horrors or the nightmares of the subconscious. Artists like Jean de Buffet are gonna be also inspired by the collection made by Prince Horn because it is gonna be huge by this new generation of artists. And he's going to create what is called art brut, the raw art. Artists that are just expressing and some, somehow they teach themselves to paint just to express their inner souls. And I have to say a little bit about Yayoi Kusama because Yayoi Kusama, she uses art as therapy. She still does. And she's gonna say, forget yourself, become one with eternity, become part of your own environment. She still uses art, but when she was um, a small girl, her mother was physically abusive. She had hallucinations since childhood. Somehow she had this curtains of, 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 of dots and she describes that she used to see everything with this transparent curtain of dots. And probably this is, this is her mother, probably, uh, this is a painting that she, or a drawing that she made when she was 10 years old. And she describes that the entire universe was filled with patterns. Myself was eliminated and I had returned and been reduced to the infinity of eternal time and the absolute space. Dots, dots, and dots. Accumulations, she called them. And she began with a very intimate, small scale. But again, through repetition, she was able to control somehow her anxiety. And also she was painting what she saw. So there's a sense of vastness in some of her paintings. She created this great depth of my inner heart as she is going to say. The accumulation of repeated marks as she's going to describe, she is going to translate the hallucinations and the obsessional visions that she had somehow into her art. And I'm showing you some of her, her paintings because she said, through art, I was also able to enter into normal society. But up until then, I was hunted by suicidal impulses. So she was healed through art. She moved to New York in 1958. She was part of the pop art movement, she kept on painting from her hallucinations, the infinite nets as she called them as well. So there's this idea of a monotonous stroke. And I'm gonna show you exactly how she made those kind of infinity nets. So first of all, she only moves the wrists. It's not like this gestural movement like uh, Pollock, Jackson Pollock or the artists that are moving everything while they are painting. It's only the movement of the wrist. It is very therapeutic. So you can lose yourself in this activity, just doing that. 
over and over, repeating it, repeating it. And then she would just move the, um, the, the, the canvas. She would change the orientation of it. And she would start again from the other corner and again and again and again from the four corners until she would get something like this. So these are her infinity nets. But by understanding how she creates them, we understand that it is just a very small movement of the wrist how she creates those infinity nets. She covered everything with dots, but she was hospitalized regularly from overwork, from hallucinations, from depression, from suicidal thoughts, and she kept on going until she checked herself into the hospital for the mentally ill in Tokyo, where she still lives. And by choice, she lives there. She has her studio very, very close to uh, the hospital where she walks every day and she still works. And for her, art was really a healing process. She's gonna say, if it were not for art, I would have killed myself a long time ago. So we go back to Giverny when Monet bought the house, first of all, then he's, and the house is right here in the corner. Then he's gonna have this parcel right here with his garden. And then he's going to expand it and he's gonna create the Japanese garden, which is where you see the lake right here. And it's gonna be his source of inspiration, but also his work because he tended by himself to the flowers, to the plants that he had around him. So it's not only the way that he wanted to paint, but he was also surrounding himself with beautiful things. So it was also where he could meditate, where he would be calm and tranquil and also inspired. He's going to make this big, as they, they, they call it the grand decoration, which he's going to expand his studio as you find here in this photograph. In the Palm Museum, somebody's saying there is an immense exhibition of Yayoi Kusama. Yes, there is an immersive um, exhibition of Yayoi Kusama. You can go to those, to the uh, one of the um, mirror infinity rooms in uh, if you are interested to go to the um, to the Pam. Um, it is really a very interesting experience because it is immersive, as, as Tony is saying, but also you have this interaction with her art. So when we are talking about his water lilies, he created many of them. For example, this one, this is one panel, just the left panel of, of a series of three. So not only the ones that are in L'Orangerie, but many others. And uh, Monet was really creating something very soothing, very beautiful at the same time. You immerse yourself in his brushstroke and if you go and, and you see one of them and you see them close enough, it is more almost an abstract representation because here I'm showing you an example of how he's going to recreate that reflection and also they're presenting the water lilies. And it looks almost like an abstraction of it, an abstract paintings. So our contemplation is very important for our well-being. And not only in a museum or a gallery, you can buy a poster and have it in your house and have that feeling also of tranquility. And um, yes, in the Rubel Museum, there's another. Yes, you're right. It was, I'm not so sure if they opened it again. It was, there were two of them, by the way, two Kusamas at the uh, Rubel, uh, Rubel um, Museum, uh, but I'm not so sure they are open again. They, you, they closed them, I don't know, during, during the, uh, the pandemic, but I'm sure they will open them or probably they're open already. So I was going to say, I was saying about <clears throat> the, um, the contemplation of art. And if you get, close enough to the paintings by Monet. They are about color. They are about texture. They are also movement. And you can be in front of a painting that you don't like, that you actually hate, but also that is healing. Why do I say that? Because it doesn't have to be beautiful. It has to move something in you. Your brain starts working you're not just laying there uh, in, in your house doing nothing. You are doing something with your brain. There are a lot of inter there's a lot of interaction between the art piece and yourself. 
So your soul somehow connects with art. But I'm saying not only go to a museum and have your selfie taken there because you're already in the museum and let the world know that you are also a museum goer. No, sit down, engage yourself with art. And that is really um, the way that you heal yourself. Monet knew how to represent the reflection of sunlight, the um, feeling that you get from a painting that is very big and you feel surrounded by it. So it's not only Monet, but I want to, of course, because many people know about Monet and also about the water lilies. And he said about this, I have painted these canvases as monks of former times illuminated their missiles. So imagine this monk in a monastery uh, far away from civilization, just painting, illuminating a manuscript for the love of God. This is also a meditative form of healing. And Monet said, they don't owe anything to anything else than the collaboration of loneliness and silence to a fervent, exclusive attention that borders on hypnosis. And if you think about that communication, that connection with art, it helps you move to a different world, be in another place, and not probably with so much stress of our daily routines and probably just think about other things. The Grand Decoration by Monet was placed in L'Orangerie in Paris. And he said about this, I was once briefly tempted to use water lilies as a sole decorative theme in a room along the walls, enveloping them in the singlessness of its motif. This was to have created the illusion of an endless hole of water without horizon or shore. Here, nurse thought from overwork could have relaxed, lulled by the result, I'm sorry, by the restful side of those still waters and to who, whosoever <clears throat> lived there. <clears throat> the room would have offered a refuge for a peaceful meditation at the center of a flowering aquarium. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, as a conclusion, we can use art as therapy, as um, Kosama did, I'm sorry, huh. <clears throat> too much talking. As Yayoi Kosama did, she used art to express herself, um, but also to heal herself, but also not only as art therapy, but artists have used art to express themselves, the collective angst, the inner soul, their own fears, their depression, their own problems, their troubles. It has been used in psychiatric institutions as well to diagnose, to treat people. And on the other hand, we can use art for calming effects by just appreciating it. So you have both worlds, just contemplating or creating. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm gonna stop my share. And let me just open it up so people can um, ask questions. Katya, that was fascinating. Absolutely oh, you. fascinating. You <laughs> took the topic and you took it to the hilt. Hannah and I were texting and how amazing this topic went. You were fabulous. Thank you, man. Questions, anybody? Thank you very much. Mm, thank you, everyone. Thank you, you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing all the comments. Beautiful. Thank you. Questions, please. <laughs> it made me remember a lot of the classes that we had together. Of course, I am. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful expression and the, the healing is realistically incredible. And you know about that, Sam. <laughs> I know people here that are psychiatrists, psychologists, and they know uh, a lot about that. 
<laughs> and I'm seeing all the comments. Beautiful. Thank the you. Comments are fabulous. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very I much. have a question for you. Okay. You said you said something about there are interactive museums in Miami. Oh yeah. Yes. Where? Yeah. Well, that one is in. Come uh, on, what's the name of <coughs> Apalaca or Paloca? <coughs> oh my God. The super blue. <laughs> super blue. Yeah, Super Blue is in front of the Rubel Museum, by the way. Oh. Super Blue is an interactive, uh, there's a lot of exhibitions and they're all always changing. That one, I think it's still on that one, but that is uh, one that actually you play with it. And if you rub the wall or the floor, it changes. Oh. Line moves, there are flowers coming up. <laughs> it's really very interesting. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. I, I still see the, the wonderful, um, <laughs> yeah, a la pata. Thank you, Anna. I just, I said a paloca, it was a la pata. Um, mm. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, Linda and Barry have questions for you, Martin. So, um, go ahead. Who's first? I don't have a question. I don't know if you can see this. Can you or it's not? It's blurry. It's, blurry. Really, it's a shame <clears throat> because this was at the Van Gogh exhibit um, in Houston, and it was a painting I never saw. I just loved it, and that's why I brought it home uh, in my phone because he did this while he was in the hospital, and you were saying that um, you know he started to do very passive soothing. This is Van Gogh's passive soothing things. Um, I, I'm really sorry you can't see it. I'm trying so oh, hard. Yeah, well, you can send it to me later. Okay. For, for the rest of the people, I don't know which one it is, but uh, yeah. But, but it's you a know, garden. It's a garden. Garden. Well, Linda is, is doing exactly that. So she has an image that she loves and she has it on her phone or she, or she brought it back from, uh, or, or, or you can buy a poster and have, have it besides you well it will really it's 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 helpful yeah thank you linda so I'm sorry i can't share it yeah it's in the very has a question barry barry yes hi uh, well, great to just get to see you and say hello uh hi. i did send you actually just now a, a van gogh that i saw in a buenos aires um museum and i can't remember whether i sent that to the group uh, that you were in but I, I can't remember the name of the town but i went to the immersive van gogh in, in the south of France in Provence that, because you sent me there. Um, I can't remember, it, it was, it was. I think it's the original interactives and it was in a giant um, quarry. So there were these huge rooms oh. the size of soccer fields and multiple, and you just walked from room to room with these, you know, shaved stone. It was, it was really quite spectacular. That show came here, that Van Gogh show, but it was really amazing there. So anyway, I, I did send you this picture that, of a Van Gogh that I had never seen before. It was a winner. Yeah, I, I think I remember the one that you're talking about. Yeah, I sent it to you again. And, and um, anyway, I, it, lovely to see you. You knew thank I was gonna make the excuse to say thank, hello. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, okay. But if, even, even what Barry's saying, even if you're not looking at the art itself and you're going to those experiences, the Van Gogh experience or whatever, it's also very, you know, it's very soothing. It's really, a a place to be and um you're surrounded by things that you love that you like and that you enjoy and that's healing well, yeah I'm glad you're back in town uh, thank you there's a question from tiffany but tiffany you have to unmute i have uh, also oh. something to say Hello. Right. one minute stephanie, stephanie and then vicky mm -hmm. yes i was wondering if you would speak more about the experience of looking at a art piece that you dislike i think you said hate even if you hate it um it's because that... yeah what i say is that of course not when you're going through a crisis i i will that that's my experience if you're going through a crisis just choose whatever you like but if you're not it's healing because it helps you um your brain connects somehow and it's busy thinking or feeling so that is also some kind of, of a human emotion mm -hmm. That needs to get them going so that connection is important so sometimes i and and if you are if you are feeling that you're an outsider or uh probably you have a, a, a 
a depression and you are isolated and you go back and you go to a museum and you see something that you really hate, <laughs> it will also connect somehow. You feel human. It's not, probably it's not pleasing, but the, the brain connects. And that is a study that he, uh, they, they've done that the, the, the motion that, or, or how the brain gets in motion through art, even if you hate it, it's a good thing because it helps you think and feel. So that is, <laughs> oh, unmute yourself if you want to say something again. Oh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think Vicky was going to say something. Yes, I wanted to say something. I wrote it in the chat, but not everyone looks at the chat. And when you just begin your speech or your class, I wrote that I saw an exhibition that was marvelous because it was Monet and Rothko in the same room. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was marvelous because both of them uh, want, want us to be in a, a conscience about color and without looking everyone, every, uh, somewhere else. And uh, I think that that is part of the connection of art because when you're wor worried about your everyday life and you connect with a painting or you only stand there and you let your feelings go because uh, you are seeing some colors that uh, makes you flour flourish your feelings, that's uh, very healing. That's yeah. what I wanted to say. Thank you. When, where, where was that exhibition? It was uh, in the same town as uh, Monet's house at the Giverny, ah, Giverny. Paris. Giverny. Yes. Oh, beautiful, Giverny. Oh, wow, beautiful. Yes, that yes it was. Wonderful, and, and really, and, and amazing. of course, I didn't know of that exhibition, but I thought of that because what you're saying is exactly that. L'Orangerie embraces you, for example, the water. Exactly. Rothko also uh -huh. embraces you. It's amazing, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Okay, but I want to add something, which is that um, not only is um, observing art or immersing yourself in art healing and doing art, but I think that an evening like this, where you see people engaged in learning about art from someone who's really gone through a lot in the past few months and is so optimistic and positive about um, how art can help heal us. And I think that community. Um, I mean, what a great combination, art and community, and um, really connecting with each other, just through a discussion about art. So I really want to thank you uh, during these 10 days of connection for your helping us to connect to each other also. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. Thank you again to the friends of the Stealing Road Library. And uh, really, you have been great. <laughs> okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, Bacha, and the good news is that tonight, uh, Bacha committed, well, I don't want to use the word committed, but has um, <laughs> agreed to um, uh, give us, uh, to, to be here during the summer, giving us um, uh, another series on art, and we'll uh, keep you posted. So thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Bacha. Thank you. And uh, we hope to thank see you, you tonight in person at um, our Swapping Stories event. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.